Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. In the last video, we covered the history of Ireland from its early beginnings and left off with the rule of Henry VIII, which was a crucial time period for Ireland as the War of the Roses had ended with Henry's father, Protestantism started being introduced to Ireland, and Henry made himself King of Ireland rather than just Lord of Ireland, and then died in 1547. Henry was succeeded by his son, who became Edward VI. Edward was the son for whom Henry had wished throughout his reign, and the Protestant heir that the English were glad to see. He lived to succeed his father, but unfortunately, he was sickly throughout his life. Edward died in 1553 from an unknown cause, likely tuberculosis or another disease affecting the lungs, though, as with most deaths of historical figures, some people speculate he was poisoned. This created an interesting turn of events for not only England, but Ireland as well. During Edward's reign, he and his administration had begun to feel as though bringing Ireland to English rule required brute force. The surrender and regrant policy of Henry failed almost immediately, as the Gaelic lords had agreed to it to get the king off their backs, but then went back to ruling their own lands in their own way, and found the government in Dublin too weak to do anything about it. Though attempts were made to prevent her ascension, following the death of Edward, his older sister Mary became Queen of England. Mary, unlike her father and younger brother, was firmly Catholic and would try to drag England from Protestantism back to Catholicism. In England, her methods of doing this would earn her the name Bloody Mary, but in Ireland, the Irish were fairly content with this. Catholicism was not disappearing in Ireland, and the English had often lacked the power to change that. The Irish were glad to see Mary on the throne, but nevertheless, they weren't sure about the future and still felt a stronger loyalty to their own people and to the Pope and the Church, which, in their eyes at this time, kind of came before the English monarch. Perhaps they were justified in doing so. Mary, though a Catholic, was still an Englishwoman and made efforts to control Ireland, largely through the use of plantations, a tactic which would change the face of Ireland forever. Plantations were essentially forms of colonizing Ireland with loyal Englishmen. Queen Mary's main efforts were in the modern-day Offaly and Leash, called the Plantation of the King's County and Queen's County. These areas were specifically chosen to displace rebellious Irishmen, the O'Connors and O'Moores, in 1566. The local Irish weren't exactly content with this and pursued warfare against the English. Naturally, the English had a hard time attracting settlers to such an area. I'm sure you can imagine that if you were a well-off Englishman or Englishwoman, you wouldn't want to uproot in an already unstable time to go live in a war zone. And for all intents and purposes, these plantations essentially became military fortifications. In November of 1558, Mary died. Despite attempts to prevent it, her sister, Elizabeth, would succeed her. Once again, England was to change religions, as her sister was a Protestant and wished to continue the work of her father. Securing Ireland was now once more, in modern terms, a matter of national security for the Protestant English, hoping to prevent the island from allying with the Spanish or French and being used as a base from which a Catholic invasion could come, justifying further the very costly efforts to subdue the island. This fear was not quite so unrealistic, and in fact, in Elizabeth's first years as ruler, she was faced with this issue. In Ulster, the Earl of Tyrone, Shane O'Neill, acted increasingly troublesome. He had taken the rule of Tyrone illegally in the eyes of the English, as his father had declared his firstborn son his successor, but in accordance with Gaelic Brehan law, Shane took the position for himself and defeated English attempts to stop him. Though an enemy of England and an ally of the Scottish MacDonald clan, which was settling in Antrim at the time, who were foes of the English, Elizabeth was forced to negotiate. She offered to allow Shane to keep his rule, so long as he accepted English law and submitted to the Lord Deputy of Ireland, the Earl of Sussex. But he refused, and in 1561, Shane defeated the English again at the Battle of Red Sagams. Within his reign, he would become the enemy of other Irish lords, the Macdonalds of Scotland, and the English. Surrounded by enemies, he went so far as to invite the French into the fight, and even offered to become a subject of the French king. Consequently, he was heavily pursued by the English under Sir Henry Sidney, but he was beheaded by the Antrim Scots before they could reach him in 1567. Shane's head was taken to Dublin, where it rested on a pike on the castle walls. 
Elizabeth continued to pursue a military campaign against Ireland, and though Shane O'Neill was defeated, the O'Neills and Ulster in general were and would continue to be a problem for the English. Elizabeth's forces swept through Ireland, subduing much of the island, removing Catholicism wherever they saw it, often violently, and reforming the island to be truly English, not Anglo-Irish, or worse, Gaelic-Irish. Yet, Ulster remained the most defiant. Shane's successor, Turla Lanark, gathered together an Irish and Scottish force to stand against the English invaders. At the same time, rebellions and conflict in Munster were sprouting up in response to Elizabeth's attempts at plantation there. These plantation attempts would also be disastrous as the rebellions continued for decades with the slaughtering of the innocent, scorched earth tactics, guerrilla warfare, mercilessness against foes, and foreign intervention from Spain and the Pope. By the 1590s, one-third of Munster's population had died from the conflict, starvation, and sickness. In Ulster, conflict came again, under a ruler whom the English had thought to be loyal to the crown, Hugh O'Neill. Hugh O'Neill had formed an alliance of Ulster chieftains and asked for assistance from Spain, and then moved against England, sparking an event in April of 1593 which would come to be known as the Nine Years' War. The English brought together an army of 27,000 men to deal with this threat, the largest force to invade Ireland up to that point ever. Despite this intimidating force, the Irish were seeing victory, and by 1596, were receiving supplies and later soldiers from the Spanish. The Spanish Armada had been defeated by the English a decade earlier, and they were eager to get back at them, and deal a blow to them and the two countries' continuous struggle. Essentially, all of Ireland outside the Pale was in open rebellion and in league with the Catholic Spanish. The Nine Years' War was more than just a thorn in the side of England. Winning it was now a matter of securing England itself. At the Siege of Kinsale from 1601 to 1602, the tides turned on the Irish. Their defeat at the hands of Charles Blount, the Earl of Mountjoy, would cause the Spanish to pull out from their intervention and the rebellion in Ireland to fade. On March 30th, 1603, Hugh O'Neill surrendered. Conflict would then slowly start to come to a close in April. Though Elizabeth had died a week prior, on March 24th, she had finally achieved what no other English ruler had, rule of the entire island of Ireland. It came at great cost, however. England was in debt by around 400,000 pounds. At least 100,000 people died in this conflict, including 30,000 English soldiers, largely from famine and disease. Many of the earls left Ireland not long after, in an event known as the Flight of the Earls, to stay in Catholic Europe and look for military backing to return to Ireland and reclaim it. Elizabeth was succeeded by her cousin James, who was James I of England and Ireland, and James VI of Scotland. Scotland was held in a personal union with England and Ireland, but existed as its own country with its own laws. Nevertheless, the three countries, along with, of course, Wales, which was at this time under England, but not to be forgotten, were all united under one monarch for the first time in history. James would continue much of the work of his Tudor predecessors, namely plantations and spreading Protestantism in Ireland. Throughout his kingdom, Catholic priests were banished and attendance at Protestant religious services were compulsory, though as usual, these laws had much less effect in Ireland which still remained Catholic. Admittedly, however, James lightened up on Irish Catholics more than his predecessors, avoiding potential conflict. James's lasting legacy in Ireland would be continuing the plantations, most significantly in Ulster. As we've discussed, attempts at plantation in Ireland prior to this were significant failures. This time, James focused on Ulster, the land which was historically difficult for the English to control, and an area where the government had an opportunity to seize land with less commotion, as much of the land was owned by the rebellious earls who had left in the flight of the earls. By 1610, after land and population surveys were undertaken and maps were created, the process of plantation had begun. Many who were given land were the servitors, soldiers who had served the queen loyally during the Nine Years' War, and men who could, furthermore, defend the territory if need be. Many others came from England and especially Scotland, where Presbyterian Scots became the Ulster Scots. There was naturally great emphasis on these settlers being Protestant. 
If they were Catholics, it would defeat the purpose after all. However, many native Irish were granted lands as well in exchange for loyalty to the crown, though their taxes were higher. The process of plantation in Ulster continued with John's successor Charles I, and by 1641, the population of planters in Ireland reached about 100,000, which was one-tenth of Ireland's population at the time. A huge wave of people in a short time, but regardless, in the rest of Ireland, Catholic Irish still controlled three-fourths of the country. Families such as the Johnstons, Grahams, Armstrongs, Montgomerys, Hamiltons, Gibbons, etc. were active in this plantation. Naturally, the English were placing emphasis on their loyal and Protestant planters over the Anglo-Irish, now referred to as the Old English, the descendants of the Normans, if you recall, and of course the Gaelic Irish. James had held things together fairly well, but Charles I was a lot less successful of a monarch in many ways, as we will see, and upset the Irish, the Old English, and even the planters. Furthermore, he was not alone in this, his Lord Deputy of Ireland, Thomas Wentworth, the Earl of Stratford, played a big role too. Charles had major enemies in England and Scotland as well. Early on in his reign, he became involved in the Thirty Years' War, a conflict in Europe defined by religious differences but also political struggles. Throughout his reign, Charles would lose the support of Parliament and be in constant conflict with them, never truly seeing eye to eye. When Charles had attempted to force Anglican religious practices on the Presbyterian Scottish, it led to the Bishops' War, when the Covenanters of Scotland rebelled. Parliament refused to give Charles the funds to fight his fellow Protestants, the Bishops' War would be the prelude to the English Civil War, which was a conflict belonging to a much larger series of conflicts known as the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. England was about to spend the rest of the century with the power in England being bounced around to various factions, and as with other incidents in English history like the War of the Roses, this was going to affect Ireland significantly as well. In Ireland, the government in Dublin felt much the same way as the Parliament of England, and when the Lord Deputy of Ireland was raising an army to assist Charles, they executed him. People in England began to choose sides in a civil war which was now inevitable. Those loyal to the King, English Catholics, the nobility, and the Welsh and Cornish came together as the Royalists under Charles. The Protestants, Scottish, and common folk tended to support the Parliamentarians under the rebellious Parliament. In Ireland, a similar divide was taking shape. The Ulster planters and the government in the Pale leaned towards supporting the parliamentarians, whereas the Irish Catholics, who saw Charles as a more lenient king, especially compared to the more devoutly Protestant parliamentarians and hostile Protestant Scottish who threatened them, saw Charles as the better option. The Irish feared a starkly Protestant government who would wage war on their beliefs and their country. The English and Scottish feared a king who ruled without parliament and could even restore Catholicism to the nation with the help of an Irish army. Rebellion in Ireland erupted in October of 1641. Catholic Irish gentry such as Philem O'Neill, Rory O'More, Donna McCarthy, and Conor Maguire planned to surprise the English and take Dublin Castle and parts of Ulster, and then issue demands for the rights of Catholics to be recognized. They intended to do this with little bloodshed, and figured that when they controlled these areas, the Irish Catholic majority would support them. Unfortunately for them, a Protestant spy, Owen O'Connolly, discovered the plot and the element of surprise was gone. Dublin Castle was not taken, but areas of Ulster were captured. They claimed to be acting in the name of the king, but this was almost certainly not the case, and his supposed instructions were forgeries. But it helped give the parliamentarians the incentive to move against the king anyway. The English reacted by sending an army into Ireland, fearing the worst. The brutality of these soldiers only exacerbated things and caused more of the Irish to rise up in rebellion. As the country's situation inflamed, things became bloodier in Ulster. Amid a poor harvest and economic decline, the local peasants rose up in anger and fear against the Ulster settlers, killing many innocent families. The leaders of the rebellion tried to stop them, but they were unable to prevent the swarm of peasants that they had inadvertently unleashed. Estimates put the total number of Ulster planters at 4,000 killed, with around 10 to 12,000 more killed by related famine and disease. The English, for propaganda reasons, slightly exaggerated this number to 200,000. It's uncertain whether or not there were even 200,000 Ulster planters in total, 
But this goes to show a how crucial the English felt getting the population on their side was, and b how little people really knew because of how poorly information traveled in the 17th century. Charles sent forces to Ireland who were purportedly there to put down the rebellion, but in truth ended up working with the Irish rebels. In 1642, the English Civil War had truly begun. As the parliamentarians declared their intention to punish all Catholics for the rebellion of the prior year, nearly all Ireland rose up in revolt. Later that year, in May, the Irish gentry met at Kilkenny and established central leadership under the Confederation of Ireland. This was not really an independence movement, but it was absolutely a movement against the English to force them to recognize the rights of Catholics. The Pope sent an envoy, partially in support of the rebellion, but also to ensure a focus on Catholicism, not merely land or political rights. By 1649, the English and Scottish had captured King Charles and beheaded him. The English Civil War had, for now, been won with a parliamentarian victory, and England came under the rule of their new government, with a man named Oliver Cromwell in control of the new model army, one of the most powerful armed forces in the world at the time. With England secure, Cromwell thus planned to move into Ireland, where he would become one of the most hated figures in Irish history. He arrived in Ireland in August of that year focusing on taking and securing Ulster and the major cities. By winter, much of the island was under his rule. By 1652, Ireland had been subdued. Cromwell sought not only to subjugate the Irish, but eradicate Catholicism. During the period of 1641 to 1652, Ireland's population was cut almost in half by disease, famine, and brutal unrestrained killing, and the majority of the dead were Catholics. Soldiers and civilians alike were killed and enslaved, and shipped off to work in the Caribbean, including Catholic priests who were a specific target as there were often bounties placed on them. Many were clubbed to death to save bullets. Some were lucky and fled to Spain or France. Cromwell began confiscating land from the Irish, banning many of the former rebellious Catholic landowners to, as I said, the Caribbean as slaves or to desolate regions in Connacht. The land was then returned to Protestant lords and soldiers who were owed wages. Thus, the land was ruled in the majority by Protestants. About 10,000 Protestants settled throughout Ireland in lands given to them as payment for their services. Soldiers were required to keep their weapons and serve as a militia. In England, Cromwell was essentially acting as a king in all but name, but he did not live to rule for long, dying in 1658. England would return to the rule of a monarchy, as Charles II, Charles I's son, claimed the throne. Charles II would make the wise move of pardoning many of those who had acted against his father, including in Ireland, but he would not allow all of the changes to remain. He moved to return land to a small percentage of the Catholic population in Ireland who could prove that they were not a part of the rebellion. It was not a huge increase, going from only about 10 to now 20% of the land being owned by Catholics, but it slightly eased the still very strong tensions and the grave times Ireland was facing. The tables flipped yet again in England as Charles II named a Catholic heir to the throne, who would become James II in 1685. This, as you might expect, caused a great deal of commotion in England, having a Catholic monarch threatened Protestants in England and their hold on Ireland, especially as James had named a Catholic Lord Deputy of Ireland. The commotion settled down when he named his daughter Mary, who was married to William of Orange, Stadtholder of the Netherlands, his heir, both of whom were Protestant. The English breathed a sigh of relief. And then he changed his mind. He named his Catholic son to be his heir, and Parliament rose up against him to challenge the monarchy once again. In an event known as the Glorious Revolution, William was made king along with his co-monarch wife, Mary. James fled to Ireland, where he knew the Catholic population would support him. In Ireland, this led to the Williamite Wars, which was both a war for the throne of England, but also an Irish attempt at rebellion and revenge against the Protestant elite. With a Catholic English king making a grab for the throne, this was their chance. James, with backing from King Louis XIV of France, attempted to secure control of Ireland, but by 1691, Limerick had been taken, and he recognized his defeat was inevitable. 
he abandoned his forces, fleeing to France, earning him the name Seamus on Hakka, Seamus being the Irish equivalent word for James, Seamus, James, Sean, John, etc., and on Hakka being a title that you don't really want as a ruler. The Protestant elite resumed command of Ireland, Catholics were barred from a number of positions, observance of Catholicism was banned, and a large number of rebels were deported to France in an event known as the Flight of the Wild Geese. It is from this time that the Protestant Irish associate themselves with the color orange, an association which lasts to this day, and the victory of this war is still celebrated by the Protestant Irish as well. The Protestants cracked down on Irish Catholics again, who had been troublesome throughout the 17th century. The distinction between the Gaelic Irish and the Norman Irish disappeared. Old penal laws were reintroduced alongside new ones. Catholic land ownership fell significantly. Catholics could not vote or hold public office. They could not run schools, they could not enter legal professions, and they could not bear arms or hold high ranks in the army. However, it was not illegal per se to be a Catholic. The English at this point were more concerned with controlling the Catholics rather than converting droves of them, and thus Catholicism was heavily regulated and looked down upon, but not exactly illegal. Nevertheless, Catholicism held on strongly in Ireland. At the start of the 18th century, 75% of the country was still Catholic, being ruled by less than the top 25% as now Presbyterian Ulster Scots weren't on the same level as Anglican Irish either. The English still, however, made conversion an enticing and easy option. Publicly denounce Catholicism, convert to the Protestant faith, and your rights were returned. Some went along with this, many did not. In 1707, under Queen Anne, the successor of the joint monarchs King William III and Mary II, the Acts of Union merged the kingdoms of England and Scotland into the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Ireland was no longer just a possession of England, it was now a part of the British Empire, which would spend the next two centuries becoming the largest empire in world history. Compared to the 17th century, when blood was spilled across the whole island of Ireland in rebellions, religious conflicts, and civil wars, the early half of the 18th century was a less violent time for Ireland, sometimes referred to as the Long Peace. Though of course, that is not to say that the Irish, namely the Catholic majority, were content with things, or that it was a prosperous age for the country. There was considerable economic, technological, social, and architectural development in this time period. Famous figures like Jonathan Swift of Dublin, known for his works such as Gulliver's Travels, and Edmund Burke, also of Dublin, a statesman and philosopher, were born in this time. Though, as you might expect from what we've covered so far, much of this progress and enlightenment was unique to the cities and the plantations. Ireland outside of this land was a rural place dependent on subsistence farming. Many of the landowners were Englishmen who weren't frequent residents of their own land in Ireland. Though firmly under English Protestant rule, Ireland was very much also a place where two distinct cultures existed parallel to each other. In 1740, a devastating famine hit Ireland, caused by extreme unusual cold. Around 400,000 people would die that winter, and another 150,000 would emigrate to Britain's colonies. The situation was exacerbated by a serious drought the following spring. Many of those afflicted were the impoverished city dwellers. The 400,000 dead and the 150,000 who would leave equaled about 30% of Ireland's population at the time. Ireland had retained its religion, but it was now, in the 1750s, beginning to lose another feature of its identity, its language. It was in the 18th century that bilingualism became more and more important to the Irish people, as knowing English allowed them to interact with the more prosperous English society. The decline of the Irish language truly took off in the 19th century as many Irish would leave for other parts of the British Empire. English would become so common that today, many outside Ireland and the United Kingdom are often not aware that a separate language apart from English exists in Ireland. But indeed, until the 19th century, Irish was the majority language of the country. Irish is a Celtic language, distinct from Germanic languages like English and German, and the Romance languages like French, Spanish, and Italian. It has not left many marks on English despite its proximity, though many names like Sean, Seamus, Colleen, which comes from Colleen, the word for girl, 
Brian, popular from, of course, Brian Baru, and Brendan, meaning Prince, are popular these days. The spelling and pronunciation are very foreign to English speakers, as well as the structure of the language itself. The phrase, on Will Gaelic Agat, meaning, do you speak Irish, is technically literally translated, is there Irish at you? There is also no exact word for yes or no. People respond with the affirmative or negative of the verb. The political atmosphere of Ireland began to change in the 60s and 70s. A major cause of such change was the American War of Independence. The British, desperate for troops, lifted many bans on Irish Catholics serving in the military, and shipped many Irishmen to fight on the side of Britain in the war. Many Irish Protestants, however, actually favored the American side of the war, as they felt as well that they should be governing Ireland on their own with less interference from London. On the colonial side, many Ulster Scots-Irish had immigrated to America, and played an important role in the War of Independence. During this time, to secure Catholic loyalties to the Crown, the English granted land-owning Catholics the right to vote. By 1783, many Irishmen took part in a successful rebellion against England, though on another continent. During the American War of Independence, the Irish Parliament, in a period of its history known as Grattan's Parliament after the very vocal Henry Grattan, began making similar requests from the British government. The Irish were less revolutionary and didn't seek to cut ties with Britain as America eventually decided to do, but the British weren't prepared to handle yet another conflict. In 1782, the British allowed the Irish Parliament more self-rule over their country. This was hardly a real concession, though. The control of Ireland still remained in London. These concessions would not halt feelings of nationalism and new political thinking which had been spreading across the Western world. In 1789, the French people revolted against their monarchy, overthrowing it and declaring their nation to be a republic. This movement would greatly inspire the Irish, especially as they had seen that decade that their parliament was almost as ineffective as ever. In 1791, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, a group of Protestants formed the Society of the United Irishmen, led by a 28-year-old man named Theobald Wolftone. The United Irishmen took a unique perspective to the concept of Irish independence, largely inspired by the French. One of the main new ideas was an alliance between Protestant and Catholic, a union of mutual Irishness and disdain for the crown in which Irish Catholic and Protestant work together in one nation. To achieve independence, Wolftone began seeking allies at home and abroad. He would form an alliance with a group of Catholic middle-class Irishmen, known as the Defenders. More threateningly, the Irish sought the aid of the French. Wolftone traveled to France to meet with the revolutionary government. When Wolftone met with this government, he painted a slightly inaccurate picture of his nation. He told them that all of Ireland favored France and was ready to rise up in unified revolution. The reality was that Ireland was heavily divided religiously and politically, and a supposed unified revolution was not guaranteed. It would have to overcome this obstacle, even if the Society of United Irishmen wanted it. The French agreed to support him, and in 1796 a force of 15,000 soldiers was sent to Ireland under General Lazar Hoche. This force alone outnumbered the British presence on Ireland, and combined with the Irish forces, had an alarming potential to drive Britain out of Ireland. It could have even set the stage for a French invasion of Britain, and from there no one knows what could have happened, and we never will, as the expedition failed. Bad December weather had prevented the French from landing, and Wolftone, devastated, said that the British had had their greatest luck since the Spanish Armada. When the British responded to the incident, they cracked down on the Irish hard. Houses were burned, people were captured, killed, and tortured, and tension began to build further. Rebellion began in May of 1798. In June, much of Northern Ireland rose up and took control of much of the area, but the forces there were overwhelmed by British and Loyalist forces. Atrocities were committed on both sides. Rape and murder of civilians was common among the British and Loyalist army, but the rebels committed their fair share of murder too, in one incident locking a number of Protestant civilians in a barn and lighting it on fire. On August 22nd, French troops finally arrived, but it was a much smaller force of around a thousand men. This would not be enough to break the British offensive, and by October, the rebellion was defeated and Wolftone was captured while aboard a French ship. 
rather than face public hanging, he cut his own throat. These incidents, beginning with calls for reform to outright bloody rebellion, would lead the Irish in the opposite direction of what they were trying to attain. The British, having struggled with Ireland for over 500 years up to this point, now tried to bring about a final solution to Ireland. The Irish would lose much of their voice altogether, in a forced joining with Britain. In the Acts of Union in 1801, Ireland's Parliament was dissolved and it came under the direct rule of the Parliament in Westminster. With the nations of Britain and Ireland effectively legally joined, the Catholic majority of Ireland was no longer as much of an issue, as the country, now including Britain, was a majority Protestant nation on the whole. With Napoleon beginning to set his sights on the whole of Europe, Britain furthermore could not risk another Irish incident and had to subjugate the island further. Ireland, now a full-fledged member of the United Kingdom, would experience a number of political and economic benefits, though, as usual, mostly favoring the Protestant elite. The political perspective of much of the Catholic populace remained mostly unchanged, especially when once more the government had promised to deliver certain rights to the Catholics, but then, with great influence from King George III, went back on it. Much of Ireland remained impoverished and underdeveloped, and there was still talk of resistance and rebellion. Another rebellion was attempted under an Irishman exiled in France, however, named Robert Emmett. Emmett designed new weapons, trained a group of soldiers, and made detailed plans regarding his rebellion, which would begin by taking Dublin Castle. Unfortunately for him, when his rebellion took place in 1803, it amounted to less than a city riot. Less than 100 people were killed on both sides, and Emmett was later captured and executed. Though his rebellion is a footnote among the many rebellions in Ireland, he is remembered more so for his words prior to his execution. Let no man write my epitaph. For as no man who knows my motives dare now vindicate them, let not prejudice or ignorance asperse them. Let them and me rest in obscurity and peace, and my tomb remain uninscribed and my memory in oblivion, until other times and other men can do justice to my character. When my country takes her place among the nations of the earth, then and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have done. Ireland continued in a similar state as it had for the past century. Protestants held the power of the country and the Catholics remained a subjugated people. Protestant land ownership, especially from absentee landlords, and a lack of agricultural development meant that farming was a mess for the lower orders in Ireland, and poor yields resulting in famine and death were common. Between 1816 and 1842, there were 16 incidents of minor to major famines in Ireland, including one in 1816 often regarded as the year of no summer. A volcanic eruption in Indonesia caused dust and debris to block out the sun. Snow fell in June and July and crop yields reduced sharply. Ireland, relying on subsistence farming, suffered considerably. As you've seen, these were not the first famines in Ireland, nor would they be the last. These issues were exacerbated by taxation. The most angering of all taxes were those placed on Catholics to support the Protestant Church. The amount of poverty and unrest led to an increase in violence and crime. Rural Ireland was a dangerous and tumultuous place. Not only were the Irish suffering, but they were angered by what they felt was a lack of means to do much about their situation. In 1823, a wealthy Catholic named Daniel O'Connell began to make efforts to try to change the situation in Ireland. He believed that much of Ireland's difficulties were rooted in the fact that Catholics remained second-class citizens, and he felt that rallying their voice would have a positive impact on the country. He founded the Catholic Association, a group of Catholics dedicated toward his ideas, which, for the cost of only one penny a month, attracted the peasantry who were hit hardest by the situation. Within five years, O'Connell would make the bold move to run for Parliament, the first Catholic to do so since the 1600s. He won the election, and the British had to decide what to do. Prime Minister Arthur Wellesley, hero of the Napoleonic Wars and born in Dublin himself, agreed to accept this, allowing Irish Catholics to vote and enter Parliament, though of course, under the conditions that this would be a very small portion of the Catholic population, reserved for the wealthy minority. Once in Parliament, O'Connell would spend his career trying to reverse the Acts of Union. He was not a complete rebel and did not seek independence for Ireland, 
but he did want to see Ireland have more self-rule and work to bring back its parliament. For Ireland to truly prosper, he believed, it couldn't be entirely ruled by London. He wouldn't succeed in his efforts towards home rule, but through his rallies and protests, which he strongly believed should be carried out peacefully, he would be a powerful force in rallying the Irish voice once more. His peaceful nature would be instrumental in reversing the Protestant perspective that the Irish Catholics were a wild rebel and ease the fears of the Ulster Protestants that this would lead to trouble and insurrection. Though as these movements went on as they had throughout much of Irish history, Ireland was beginning to face a new threat from a new invader. Across Europe, a potato blight was moving westward, affecting millions in Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, and the UK. But when it came to Ireland in 1845, it would hit hardest of all. Ireland was experiencing a population boom. It was now home to about 8 million people, and it had achieved these numbers without all the agricultural advancements of the Industrial Revolution to be found in the rest of Britain. And furthermore, with a great reliance on a single crop, the potato and only a single kind of potato, which was now under threat. When the great portion of this crop throughout the country became slowly inedible, this famine, among all the others in Irish history, earned the name on Gorta Moor, known more commonly in English as the Irish Potato Famine. The potato blight caused by Fiof, Tora, and Feistons would cause up to two million people to either die or leave Ireland. The British government had a limited response. At first, grain and corn shipments were sent to Ireland, and the government employed the impoverished in harsh labor to be able to afford food, but in 1846, when the famine truly started taking a toll, John Russell became Prime Minister. He enacted a laissez-faire economic policy and stopped the shipments, believing that it wasn't an issue for which the government should be responsible. There was a mix of response among the British landlords. Some would go bankrupt in efforts to try to help the Irish poor, but many absentee landlords would simply evict the impoverished workers and continue to ship other sources of food out of Ireland in the face of people starving and dying in the streets. One of the main government officials involved in colonial efforts, Charles Trevelyan, openly claimed that the famine was a lesson from God. It was a punishment on Catholics, and it was necessary to teach them to be less reliant on the government. This event remains one of the most controversial in the history of British and Irish relations to this day as some continue to argue that the Irish were primarily responsible for their own famine, others argue that the English were guilty of genocide, or something close to it, and others argue that no one side was to blame and that both sides made mistakes in an almost unstoppable event. 1847 is remembered as the black year of the famine. 400,000 people died in Black 47 alone. Many died from diseases caused by weakness before starvation could kill them. A year later, the drastic effects of this would encourage the failed 1848 rebellion. Many of those who could left Ireland. Emigration from Ireland had been common in the 19th century, but the famine would greatly intensify these numbers as Irish crowded on boats in unsanitary and dangerous ships to brave the voyage to places of opportunity such as nearby Britain, Canada, Australia, and the United States. Some would later return to Ireland, but the great majority would go on living in these new countries, and before long, the descendants of Irish emigrants would greatly outnumber the population of Ireland itself. In America, they would form large communities in cities like Boston and New York, but would also move westward in the country's great expansion. With the conditions from which the Irish came and the ones in which they found themselves in their new homelands, they faced heavy discrimination. At the end of the famine in 1850, a quarter of the Irish population had died or emigrated, equaling about a million dead and a million who left. Many would continue to emigrate even after the famine. Many who left, outside of Ulster, were among Ireland's more skilled and educated, which would damage Irish society further. Those who stayed bitterly resented the British, and the more peaceful movements under men like Daniel O'Connell slowly faded to more violent ones. This rebellious sentiment, however, would coalesce into a greater movement among the emigrants abroad, and many Irish separatist groups were rooted in the United States, such as the Clonagale and the Irish Republican Brotherhood, 
known also as the Fenians, in 1858. The decades after the famine among the Irish would be mostly focused on reform, resistance, and revenge, at home and abroad. In 1867, the Fenians attempted a rebellion in Ireland. In the late 60s and early 70s, the Fenians in America, many of whom were Civil War veterans, staged raids on the Canadian border, which came to skirmishes, intended to cause many Irish Canadians to rise up and put pressure on the British government to lessen their grip on Ireland. But such raids failed. The American government condemned the raids, but interestingly may have turned a blind eye to them because of Canadian and British uncertainty on a side in the American Civil War. The Irish Republican Brotherhood would nevertheless continue in its resistance to British domination of the island, oftentimes resorting to the first acts of Irish terrorism. In 1878, the Potato Blight returned to Ireland, sparking what is remembered as the Land War. Crops failed and impoverished laborers were once more evicted from their homes. The economy suffered and the threat of a return of the Great Famine concerned the Irish greatly. Unrest brewed, and in response to this, the Irish National Land League arose under Michael Davitt, a former Fenian demanding rights for the tenant farmers. The League's primary goals are summarized as the three Fs. Fair rent, fixity of tenure, and freedom of sale. They wanted to avoid outrageously high rent from absentee English landlords, wanted to avoid eviction by agreeing to a length of time in which they stayed on their land, and the right to be involved in the sale of the land. Essentially, they wanted to bring more power to the tenant farmers from the absentee landlords, and to reverse the most negative effects of English rule over lands which they felt were unjustly stolen from their ancestors. One of the most effective means of resistance was to avoid business and socialization with landlords, and those who did business with them, who were corrupt or unfair to the Irish people. One of the first to suffer from this practice in Ireland was Captain Charles Cunningham Boycott, after whom the act was named and spread across the English language. British Prime Minister William Gladstone continued his work to try to return the land to the Irish. Failing to have done so at this point could have resulted in major insurrection yet again. Such movements in Ireland would not end here, however. In 1875, Charles Stuart Parnell was elected into Parliament. He would work with Gladstone on an even bigger change, the move toward Irish home rule. Not independence, but an Irish parliament and greater autonomy. Later in his career, he would make alliances with the Fenians and the Irish Land League, which was obviously concerning to the English. In 1886, a home rule bill was introduced to parliament, but it was turned down, fearing it would cause a breakup of the entire empire. If Ireland, Britain's neighbor, could resist, then what of more troublesome places like South Africa or India? Following this, Gladstone's party lost power, and Parnell was greatly embarrassed in the discovery of an ongoing sex scandal with a married woman. He died in 1891 at the age of 45 from pneumonia. This movement itself had largely fallen apart, but the spirit of it had not, and it coincided with a returned interest in Irish nationalism and Irish identity. The Irish people challenged a culture which they felt was becoming worryingly foreign in an effort to save their own from extinction. Old customs, culture, history, and the revival of the language returned in this age with the question of home rule on the table. Organizations like Con Ronna Gaelaga, dedicated to preserving the Irish language, were founded. Many great figures like Oscar Wilde and William Butler Yeats lived in this time. Home rule was enticing to Ireland except, of course, in Ulster, where the inhabitants, namely the Protestant Church and the Orange Order, were quite openly against it. Much of their position rested in union with the British. They weren't interested in separatism with a nation which might not benefit them as much. Many unionists met in Belfast to work against Irish home rule. The government made attempts to push the question to the side by appeasing the rabble with the Land Purchase Act of 1903, but it did not work to that end. By 1912, the question of Irish Home Rule was back on the table in Parliament. It was approved and was set to take effect in September of 1914. Britain had to take a measure to secure rule over Ireland and granted the country its own Parliament again. But still, not everyone was satisfied. 
Nearly 500,000 Unionists signed the Ulster Covenant on September 28th of that year, swearing to use any means necessary to prevent Home Rule. The first man to sign was Sir Edward Henry Carson. The following year, a militia known as the Ulster Volunteer Force was organized, with 100,000 men prepared to go to war to defend their place in the British Empire, even if it were London who delivered Home Rule to the Irish. Irish nationalists formed the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army as a response. The island seemed on the brink of civil war. This civil war may very well have come if not for external problems. In 1914, World War I broke out, dragging the British Empire along with Ireland into war with Germany, Austria, and the Ottoman Empire. The British, needing to focus all of their attention on Germany, suspended the Home Rule Bill until the end of the conflict. While they would have liked to have frozen Ireland for the duration of the conflict, it didn't quite work out that way. The Irish had mixed views on their participation in the war. Ulster, loyal to the British Empire, fully participated. Many Irish nationalists agreed that Germany was as much of a threat to them as it was to Britain, though a minority of nationalists firmly disagreed, and would have rather just formed a defensive force, left out of the war until absolutely necessary. 200,000 Irishmen would fight in the First World War, and 30,000 would die serving in the British Army, while another 20,000 fighting in other armies such as the American one would perish as well. In the first day of the Battle of the Somme, over 5,000 men from the 36th Ulster Division were killed. One-tenth, or one-sixth depending on how you look at it, of all Irishmen killed in the war in a single day. With many Irish fighting abroad, however, the ones back home would take advantage of the opportunity that came with Britain being distracted. A revolution would begin in Ireland, not the bloodiest in Irish history, but perhaps the most important. With Britain distracted by the war, radical Irish nationalists felt it was their time to move. They began plotting rebellion, even attempting to gain help from the Germans, though a shipment of German rifles was prevented by the British Navy. On April 24th, 1916, Easter Monday, a group of Irish radicals took control of key public buildings in Dublin and declared the formation of the Independent Irish Republic. They flew the Irish tricolor, created in 1848 and modeled off the flag of the French Republic. The white in the middle of the green and orange symbolized the hopes of a unification between Catholics and Protestants. The British were caught off guard, but when they responded, they did so brutally. 485 were killed on both sides, thousands were wounded, and much of central Dublin was destroyed in the fighting. The leaders of the rebellion were caught and executed. Not many Irishmen had immediately risen up to take part in the revolution, but when Britain, in their eyes, excessively punished Ireland for the uprising by putting the country under martial law and imprisoning many innocent people, it sparked a greater revolutionary sentiment. The leading Irish political party, Sinn Féin, which was incorrectly blamed for the uprising, took advantage of the situation and created its own parliament, called Dáil Éireann, rejecting British rule. It created the Irish Republican Army to defend its cause. When the British began conscription in Ireland, matters became worse. And when World War I ended, things began to pick up. A few months later, on the 21st of January 1919, the Irish War of Independence had begun. Leading the movement was Eamon de Valera, Arthur Griffiths, and the military commander Michael Collins. The British would later reinforce the Royal Irish Constabulary with a force known as the Black and Tans, after the color of their uniforms. They were largely veterans of the First World War, and they would ruthlessly pursue the Irish Republican Army now fighting a guerrilla war against the British, including targeting civilians. Rape, murder, torture, and the burning of entire villages were common. They killed priests and politicians. One famous incident was the killing of Thomas McCurtain, the Lord Mayor of Cork and a longtime rebel who was killed in his home in front of his wife. One of the most famous incidents of the overall war, however, was Bloody Sunday on November 21st. Michael Collins ordered the killing of a number of top British Army officers and intelligence network officials. 
Eleven were killed, three were wounded. The Black and Tans responded by killing three Irish soldiers they were holding prisoner and opening fire on a crowd of civilians at a football match. That year, the British government gave Northern Ireland and Belfast home rule. Though the divides between the North and South were rooted in history hundreds of years old, this was the beginning of the divide between the modern nation of Ireland and Northern Ireland, which to this day remains in the United Kingdom. Southern Ireland continued its fighting, but many on both sides would be eager to end the conflict by the following year. Peace talks began in October of 1921, with Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith attending, but not Eamon de Valera. To the disappointment of the Irish, the situation of Northern Ireland was not up for debate. Six of the 32 Irish counties would remain in the UK. However, the two sides agreed to the formation of the Irish Free State. This was not a 100% independent nation, but it did function fairly independently, in a similar way as Canada at the same time. In 1921, the British had ruled Ireland for 754 years. Collins believed that this agreement was the first step to creating a truly free Irish nation that its people had sought all that time, but others back home, like de Valera, disagreed. He believed in nothing less than total independence. In January of 1922, the Dáil put the treaty with Britain to a vote. 64 members were in favor, 57 were against. The losing half did not accept its situation peacefully, and by June a civil war broke out, with Collins on one end and de Valera on the other. In August of that year, Griffith died of a heart attack and Michael Collins was killed in an ambush. Nevertheless, in 1923, due to British help, the civil war was over with a free state victory, and de Valera surrendered. In all, 3,000 people had died in the fighting of both wars. To the Irish, the men and women who had died had made the ultimate sacrifice for a nation which now had a new future. Both the Irish and Northern Irish resented each other for the positions they had taken, but many were glad to be separated from each other and on their way toward a new future which they hoped would be free from the fear that the other would take over. Ireland and Northern Ireland began to adapt to the new ways of doing things politically, economically, socially, culturally, legally, militarily, etc. in a rather complicated time. Fascism and communism were on the rise, and it looked as though war was brewing in Europe yet again. It did. And when Britain became involved in what would become the Second World War against Germany, Though Churchill and Roosevelt encouraged Irish involvement, the Irish remained neutral. The leader of the government at the time was de Valera, who clearly was pardoned for that whole rebellion thing a decade earlier, and felt that the nation was not in the right situation to be involved in such a major war. Nor was it exactly in his eyes a war in which the Irish had to be involved. Naturally though, the Irish government favored the British. They were affected by British losses, and thousands of volunteers joined the British fight, while hundreds of thousands of others worked in British jobs. Northern Ireland, however, as a part of the United Kingdom, joined the fight fully, and was even bombed by the German Air Force multiple times for its strategic naval importance. During such bombings, firefighters from the south often helped the Northerners recover, and they would even detain German pilots. When the war was over, the Allies still somewhat frowned on the Irish neutrality. Churchill even referred to de Valera as useless, and the Soviet Union argued against their admission to the United Nations, claiming that the Irish were fascist sympathizers. In 1949, the Irish Free State became a fully independent republic. Though finally independent, the desire for unification between Ireland and Northern Ireland never truly disappeared, even as the two countries set off further in their separate ways and began to modernize. Unfortunately for the island, it would not be so simple as going separate ways, as a significant Catholic minority remained in Northern Ireland. Protestants and Catholics remained segregated. Catholics often felt that they were still second-class citizens in regard to employment, education, and living. 
Economic difficulties in Northern Ireland worried the Protestant community of foreign threats, namely of an Irish nationalist takeover. In 1968, NICRA, the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, was founded with the interest of guaranteeing Catholics the same rights and opportunities as Protestants. Though things would not go down so well, that decade, these differences would lead to a conflict in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles between Irish paramilitary organizations, Ulster Loyalist paramilitaries, and the British Army. It would quickly evolve into a political and ethnic conflict rather than an actual debate of Catholicism and Protestantism, with the Ulster Loyalists defending what they saw as their union with Britain, and the Irish attacking what they saw as an age-old incursion on their island. Protesters clashed on the streets. When the situation became out of control, the British military was sent into the area in 1969. Civilians, police, and soldiers were killed in outbreaks of violence. The Irish Republican Army arose again, pledging to fight for the rights of Catholics in the area. Many men and women, fearing that the British government had taken the side of the Northern Irish, or at least failed to protect them, began to support them. The IRA began a campaign of terrorism and guerrilla warfare in the region, bombing specific targets of national and economic importance to the Northern Irish. In 1972, Northern Ireland was once again put under direct rule from London as the situation failed to resolve. The provisional IRA continued the war, now aiming indeed to unite Ireland and expel the British. The Unionist paramilitaries acted in what they saw as self-defense, and the British government acted mainly to secure the area and end the violence. In 1976, the British ambassador to Ireland was killed. In 1979, the Queen's cousin, the Earl of Mountbatten of Burma, was killed. In 1984, Margaret Thatcher was targeted, but survived. Throughout the 90s, many areas of London were attacked. By 1989, almost 3,000 people of all walks of life had been killed in the fighting. And as the conflict extended into the 90s, many were hoping desperately for a resolution. By 1994, the British government announced that it had no personal pursuits in Ireland and sought only to objectively defend the will of the majority. Many Irish nationalists laid down their arms. Peace talks were beginning. They were even visited by American President Bill Clinton, who is one of many American presidents to have Irish heritage. Peace talks in the IRA's eyes were taking too long, and violence temporarily resumed in London. But by 1997, the ceasefire was back on again under Prime Minister Tony Blair. On Good Friday, April 10th, 1998, the Belfast Agreement was signed, though the IRA would not truly announce the end of their armed campaign until 2005. In total, 3,532 people had died and over 47,000 people were injured. I hope you've enjoyed this documentary. If you're interested, I have done documentaries on the history of other countries as well as other subjects like dreams, coffee, aliens, terraforming, and shorter videos on all kinds of subjects. I'd invite you to come check those out and to subscribe to keep up with all the videos I have coming in the future. Griff Mahagat for watching. Hey, 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 hey,